All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead and find your seat. Welcome to North Village Church. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. And y'all give a round of applause for James here leading us in worship, our guest worship leader. Fantastic. That was so good. We're going to be in Song of Solomon chapter 2. That's in the Old Testament. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one at the back or grab one of these devotionals. If you're new here today, uh, these are like $4. They're so cheap. It's like candy. We give it away. That's where we're going in our uh, sermons till August 2022. So uh, that's a great resource for you. You can turn to page 48 and uh, follow along uh, for this morning. And then we had new tablets were passed to the aisle, and that's just a, you can do the drop-down menu to kind of find your name if you've been here before. And if you're new for the first time, just give us whatever information you're comfortable with. We, we see it as a tool to help us stay connected as a church family. So, so thankful you're here today. Uh, we are going through a series called What About? And you can look at the devotionals to see where we're going for the next six weeks in this series of What About? And and uh, I, I'm guessing that throughout this series that, that we're all kind of in different places of how comfortable and uncomfortable we feel with some of these conversations. Uh, I was talking with somebody a couple of weeks ago, and they said, I'm nervous just sitting in the room. I can't imagine how nervous you must be actually on stage having the conversation. And you're right. Like, I also am very nervous uh, going uh, through this series uh, because like, I, don't, I don't like getting into hot-button conversations and debate and argument. Like, I, I don't like doing these types of things, but it's, it's important for us to enter into these conversations. These conversations are uh, important. And, and just so you know, some of that uncomfortableness, that's not going to go away just when this series is over, right? I don't want to like shock and awe you, but God's word is designed to challenge us. God's word is designed to kind of push against us, to poke on us. And it's not it's not because he wants to be mean or cruel, but in our humanity, we've all, we've all wandered from him, and God's word is there to draw us back, to see our need for Jesus and see the life we can have in him. And so lean in with the uncomfortableness, right, in this series. The first week we talked about women. The second week we talked about abortion. Last Sunday we talked about those who have never heard about Jesus. And you can find all this on, on YouTube, our YouTube channel for our church. And this morning we're talking about sex before marriage. And uh, I mean, I got, I got teenagers that are sitting right here uh, with us today. Like they, they're not only uncomfortable talking about sex uh, on a Sunday morning, but they're watching their dad talk about sex <laughs> in front of other people. Like, and I, I know sex is widely accepted in our culture, and it's possible there might be some of us here, uh, here this morning that is like, is this even like a necessary conversation? Like, isn't everybody having sex? Uh, before marriage, like, is this still, is this, is this an important conversation, right? Uh, but listen to me, four of the next six in this series, the next six conversations that we're going to lean into have to do with sex. And God's word is going to cast a completely different understanding of sex than what we take in from our culture. Does that make sense? Like our culture has kind of just jumped on the conveyor belt of, of sex. You know, like you go to the airport and those walkways, you just kind of stand and it just kind of pushes you along. It's like all of our culture has kind of jumped on the, the walkway of, of sex and we're just like, well, this is what everybody's doing. And so we just, we got our luggage and we're, we're kind of just doing it also, but... But it's important for us to, to talk about sex before marriage because God's word is going to give us a completely different understanding of sex. So this morning, we're going to hit on three points. We're gonna, why do we drift toward sex? Where do our culture's answers break down? And three, how does God's word respond? So that's when we'll get into Song of Solomon chapter 2. Uh, so let's talk about this first one. Why do we drift towards sex? couple of qualifiers as we get into this conversation. I know there's some younger ears here uh, this morning, and I, I'm going to try to be respectful with my words and, and my tone, uh, but sex 
is a conversation uh, we want to introduce to our children as, as early as possible, uh, primarily because our culture is introducing the conversation of sex to our children. So uh, from, from a parental perspective, uh, you could start talking about the concept of sex with our children as young as three, four, five, you know, not a full lecture, but just beginning to introduce the conversation. You just can't get into this conversation early enough for our children. Second qualifier is that I want to remind us of the good news of Jesus. Um, it's important for us to remember the gospel as we enter into this conversation. Um, it, it's not lost on me that we're talking about sex on a Sunday morning in worship, and I'm confident that the majority of us have had a variety of sexual experiences. Therefore, we need to remember and be reminded that the God of Scripture isn't shocked by our sexual experiences, right? All of us have fallen short sexually. Jesus knows we've fallen short. Jesus knows our thoughts. Right? Jesus knows the secret things that we've done or the secret things that have been done to us, things that we hope nobody ever finds out about. Like Jesus knows all of that. So we need to remember that the gospel, in the gospel that Jesus moves toward us in this conversation. It's very important. It's important. Uh, Jesus has come to bring healing. Jesus has come to bring forgiveness. Jesus has come to take our sexual shortcomings upon himself at the cross to put them to death and to conquer them in the resurrection so that we might have life in him, that we might be made new, that we might be cleansed, that we might find forgiveness. So it's important for us to remember the gospel as we get into this conversation. So let's talk about sex before marriage. Just to frame the question, we really need to make sure we're clear on, on two words, uh, sex and marriage. So when, when I say sex, I'm talking about sex in the broadest sense. When I'm talking about sex like two people in a bed under the covers, sex, but also talking about oral sex. Um, I'm talking about solo sex, masturbation. You know, we have a multi-billion dollar industry and in pornographic content. And, and so I, I'm talking about sex in the widest spectrum, any kind of sexual activity and everything in between. This is important to clarify because we're all coming from different experiences, right? And we need to acknowledge that there is a narrative in our culture that's pushing us toward sexual activity. You know what I mean by narrative? Like we don't even know it. It's kind of a uh, an unspoken voice is, is, is through our news and our media and our entertainment and our education. And it's, it's pushing us toward sexual activity under the idea that we need to be sexually liberated. Now, you may not even know this, but you've been, no matter what age you are, if you've got a pulse, you've been digesting on this narrative that, that we need to be sexually liberated, that somebody has put sex in jail and for the last few decades, we're trying to set sex free, right? We need to break off the shackles of sexual oppression, sexual liberation, or a common phrase in our culture today is called sex positivity. We want to be positive about all sexual activity as long as it kind of rallies around these three values. These are kind of the values of our culture today that one may not criticize someone's sexual choices. This is the, the narrative, the value of our culture that we can't criticize. The fact that I'm talking about sex today is very taboo for, for our culture because you're not even supposed to 
criticize it in any possible way. The second value our culture rallies around is that we may not coerce or cause, cause harm. So anything goes sexually as long as there's not coercion. And then three, anything goes sexually as long as there's consent, the three C's of what our culture values when it comes to sex. Now, listen, God's word affirms clearly number two and number three. Absolutely. We don't want to coerce. We want to seek uh, consent. But, But you need to know that God's word absolutely speaks into our sexual choices, right? So we need to talk, we need to make sure we're all on the same page when we talk about sex because our, our culture is pushing us toward sexual activity. And then the second part is we talk about marriage because our, our culture is a, a little mixed feelings about marriage, right? Like on, on one hand, we love engagements and weddings. Like we're very very positive that we love marriage for engagements and weddings. We love the bachelor. Right? We love the bachelorette. We love talking about the bachelorette, bachelorette, what's going to happen. We very much love that kind of stuff. We love celebrity marriages. Ooh, we love to follow that. Almost 2 billion people watched the weddings of uh, Harry and Meghan because we love the idea of marriage so much. I don't know. Are they still prince and princesses, Mike Bird? Are they, do they count? Are they out? They're out, so... But we love it. We love like just, oh, we gush over that stuff. Like we love movies and songs about love and marriage. In 2017, 4,145,237 people got married, right? We didn't have a lot of marriages in uh, 2020, 2021, but we had 4 million in 2017. And Bill Murray, my favorite actor, said, I don't want to start any trouble, but shouldn't that be an even number? Wait for that to sit in there. So we, so we talk about marriage. We love the idea of marriage in one hand, but we also have kind of a little skepticism about marriage. I mean, first, we've taken a biblical concept. We've completely watered it down. It's a little confusing for us. Uh, most of us have seen our parents go through divorce. Most of us have friends and family that are chronically unhappy in marriage and share it. Right? The old ball and chain. We receive conflicting messages about how to fix our marriage in the grocery line checkout counter, right? Conflicting messages, even if we should fix our, our marriages. And we see high results of divorce in the United States. So that marriage comes across as a, as a joke. So that as a result, just in our culture as a whole, we have mixed messages. Like on one hand, we're like, it's cool. And, uh, but, uh, 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 and so it's not really a value in our culture. Like, think about that. Like, how we kind of see marriage today, it's kind of an afterthought. Like, it's kind of a crowning achievement of things that we accomplish after we've done everything else. Like, oh, maybe, maybe we'll do marriage. It's like glorified dating. Right? If you're really serious about dating, you get married, right? Well, like, or you like parties. <laughs> like, you like parties. Like, we should do, we do a, a marriage. So that when the conversation comes up about, you know, why do we, why do we drift towards sex? What about sex and marriage? One, generally speaking, we're not really sure we should even get married. And generally speaking, we have a low view of marriage. And then two, sex is generally presented as something that's not even that big of a deal. So that we even kind of have ourselves, and maybe some of you feel that this morning, is that why, why does it even matter? Do you feel any of that? Do you feel any of that? Why, do, why does it even matter? Here's why it's matter. Let's talk about where our culture's answers break down. Point number two. We're going to talk about how sex, our, under, our culture's understanding of sex breaks down, and then we'll talk about marriage in our third point as we look at Song of Solomon. But the, the idea in our culture is that sex needs to be liberated, right? Ultimately trying to present this idea that sex is just something that's physical, right? That it's just our body, and listen, this is the narrative. We've been feeding on this, this information so much we don't even uh, realize it, that, 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 that our bodies are just physical. Sex is just physical. What we do with our body doesn't really matter, does it, right? Because it's just physical. Like we just, we've taken that in so much so that whether you're 13 years old or 60 years old and you're on your phone and you're looking at pornographic content, you, you find yourself thinking thoughts like, 
Well, it's just physical. I mean, I've been, I had a really stressful day. I, what is this stuff I'm exploring? It's just, just learning about the body, right? We have this kind of loop in our head that it's just physical. I was talking with somebody, this is a number of years ago. They, they, had, they had sex uh, outside of their marriage, and, and they came and talked to me about it. And I said, well, let's start that process of healing. And in that process, let's talk to your spouse. Their immediate response was, why would I tell my spouse? If I told my spouse, it would only hurt them. Do you hear the logic? Because the assumption is, I've just done this with my body. What I do with my body doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect me. Why would I tell my spouse? Do you hear the logic? I was talking with another person a number of years ago, and and, uh, they profess faith in Jesus, and they simply say, look, at this season of my life, I just want to have sex with as many people as possible. I'm young, I want to I uh, have fun, and, and, and I said, well, what's the plan there, like long term? And they said, well, at some point, you know, I'll get married, and, and the idea is that I'll push the reset button, and then my understanding of sex will be completely different. You hear the logic? You hear it? It's just my body. It's just physical. It doesn't really affect me. Let's, there's absolutely forgiveness and healing in Jesus, but let's not be naive that we, we can create a pattern of our body over over, over years and decades and then just magically push the reset button and not have any, any of that come with us. It'd be, it'd be foolish for us to, to think that. That's because it, it absolutely isn't just physical, right? The assumption in our culture today is that I can do something with my body physically, but it doesn't affect me spiritually or mentally or emotionally, and you need to know that sounds great for a commercial to get us to go on vacation to Las Vegas, right? That's great for a commercial. What we do in Vegas stays in Vegas, but we know that's not true. We know that's a lie, actually. This is where, how how does it break down? I mean, it breaks down because it's a lie. What, What we do with our physical body absolutely affects us. It's an absolute lie, and we know that. We know it philosophically, and we know it biologically. I'm not even going to show you scriptures right now, just philosophically and biologically. So we talk about, we know it's a lie philosophically because we know philosophically that our mind, body, and soul are interconnected. We know that. Like, if you're around kids at at a school, and they're bouncing off the wall, what does the teacher say? Let's go outside. Let's run around, let's run off some of this energy because our physical decisions affect us emotionally and relationally, right? We know that. Philosophically, we know that. Um, You read self-help, self-care articles on stress and anxiety, what are they, go for a walk, go for a run, do something with our physical bodies because it will affect you emotionally and mentally, Philosophically, we know it's a lie. Biologically, we know it's a lie. We know when we participate in sexual activity, that's any type of sexual activity that I referenced earlier. We know biologically when we come to a point in that sexual activity where there is a release, where there is a climax, That when that happens, there's chemicals that go off in our body, in our brain, called oxytocin, and it creates a relational bonding with that person or that two-dimensional object. Do you follow that? We know that biologically. So that it's biologically impossible to do sexual things with our bodies and it not affect us either with people or those two-dimensional objects. Psychologists refer to this relational bonding as sex glue. I didn't coin that phrase. That's what psychologists call it, that when we experience sexual release with people or two-dimensional objects, through masturbation, solo sex, pornographic content, we're doing two things to ourselves biologically. 
One, we are creating sex glue connections with those people or those objects. Psychologists think that that's where fetishes come from, that we have sexual experiences at a, at a young age associated with two-dimensional objects, and that, that creates fetishes. So we're, that, that, that lie that our culture, you do whatever you want, you know, in, in, start, stop, start. We're creating connections. The second thing that's happening biologically, if you're following with me, not only are we creating those connections, but because there's a start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, we're actually training ourselves mentally, emotionally, relationally to have shallow relationships with one another. Does that make sense? So that practically, this is just what happens. The average person goes through life with a myriad of sexual experiences, including myself, and we tell ourselves, we're fine. It's just my body. Sex needs to be liberated. Need to explore. It's healthy, right? We feast on the narrative of our day, and then we casually stumble into marriage, right? A very low view of marriage, and then when the relationship gets difficult, when the relationship gets challenging, when the relationship starts to break down, we look around and we say, what happened? Right? We're like totally surprised. But of course relationships are hard. We're believing a lie that sex isn't that big a deal. We're violating philosophically and biologically, which we know is true, and we're training ourselves to have shallow relationships so that when we end up in that marriage, it's difficult and we're like, what happened? Listen to me. It doesn't mean there's no hope. That's why we're talking about this on Sunday morning. Jesus absolutely brings hope. But it would be naive to think that what I do with my body is just physical and doesn't affect me. That's a lie. It's not like a little white lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell that destroys lives. It's not a, like a tickle lie. That's kind of cute. Oh, it's a lie. We absolutely need to be on the alert. The narrative isn't going to stop today. That narrative we talked about is continuing to come. And we don't need to be afraid as followers of Jesus, but we definitely need to be alert. Let's look at this third one. How does God's word respond? We're specifically talking about marriage. We're looking at Song of Solomon chapter two. It's in the Old Testament. We, we could look at all the statistics on marriage and how it's challenging in our day, but let's look at a biblical foundation of marriage in God's word. Let's look at Song of Solomon, chapter two, verses one, two, and three. Page 48 in your devotion. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade, I took great delight and sat down, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So I'm sure many of us are like, and this is helpful because, all right, so <laughs> just lean in with me. Song of Solomon is poetic language. It could be difficult to follow. The first verse is the woman. It's a relationship between a man and a woman. The first verse is the woman speaking about her beauty. In chapter one, you can read it on her own. She, she, she's devaluing her beauty, but in this relationship, she's seeing her beauty. She's like a, a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys, Mwah, right? In verse two, this is Solomon speaking, the man speaking, and he's also highlighting her beauty, right? That the rest of these ladies, they're just thorny, thorns, unattractive, but, but the but my beloved is beautiful, right? He's in, in awe. And then verse three, the woman is speaking of her love for Solomon. She says, like an apple tree among the forest. Whew. Try that out with uh, your beloved. Ooh, like an apple tree, baby. Like, rest of them, just a bunch of oak trees. Hackberries. Nothing to offer, but mine is an apple tree. In his shade, she takes delight. 
We're not exactly sure what that phrase means uh, when he says fruit being sweet to the taste, uh, but it's clear that it's sensual. Sensual language is being used. Now, at this point in the relationship, these two, they're not married, but they are definitely romantically interested in one another. And this is important. I wanted us to go to Song of Solomon because sometimes in the local church, sex is like, shh, that's the end of the song. Don't talk about it. Our culture is absolutely bullhorn talking about it. But sometimes we think sex is ooh, great, gross, you know, shame, like, shh, you know. I remember we used to have some uh, pamphlets uh, on a Sunday morning about just different conversations of our day, and, and some of them were about sex, and our elementary students uh, on Sunday morning would come by, and anything about sex, they would pick it up and they would put it at the back. So nobody, do y'all remember that? Be like, nobody needs to see that. Not before the Lord, you know? <laughs> but God's word is absolutely the path towards sexual freedom and sex positivity. In fact, you won't find anyone more positive about sex than the one who created sex, right? Especially for women. In Song of Solomon, it's the woman, not the man. It's the woman who is the dominant voice of sensual language sex positivity i mean it's the woman who seeks pursues initiates and boldly exclaims her physical attraction this is this is the ancient times also this is radical god's absolutely pro sex look at verses 4 5 and 6 this is the woman speaking. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Sustain me with raisin cakes. Refresh me with apples. Because I am lovesick, let his left hand be under my head, and his right hand embrace me. This is how my wife talks to me. <laughs> the reference to his banner is a reference to desire. So that there is a longing for sexual intimacy. Verse 5, raisin cakes were to enhance sexual desires. Leave here today, go to Costco, get some raisin cakes. <laughs> get an apple fruit tray. In verse 5, she is lovesick so that she is exhausted from her love for Solomon, she's quaking. <laughs> oh, goodness, all right? I mean, this isn't, this, God is not prudish about sex. This isn't, you know, Lady Catherine, <laughs> Mr. Darcy would never. Like, it's, it's not that at all. Instead, it's two people standing before each other, absolutely sexually interested, but they're waiting for the commitment of marriage. Look at verse seven. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. This language, it's highlighted for you. It's so important. Do not arouse or awaken love until she pleases. The gazelle and the deer, they're skittish animals. And a sexual relationship is explosive so that you don't want to casually rush into a sexual relationship. That's what, that's what it's talking about. Don't arouse or awaken love before it's time. You want to go slow. When you come upon that deer, you don't just, ah, you know, like, run. You go slow, right? Use your little ant. We need to move into it cautiously. You, you, you want the, the oxytocin and the sex glue to take place in the commitment of marriage. The biblical foundation of marriage is established in Genesis 2. We'll look at Genesis 2. I know I keep telling you one day. One day we will look at Genesis 2. We don't have time this morning 
But in Genesis 2, you see the foundation of marriage as man and woman coming together under a language that says one flesh. Our psychologists, well, they call it sex glue. They call it relational bonding. Uh, they call it oxytocin. Genesis 2 calls it one flesh. Because you want to take that multi-layered parts of that sexual relationship and you want to place it in the commitment, in the divine commitment of marriage. You see that? Our culture says, you can be casual about sex. Have sex with whoever you want. Your body needs to be liberated. Move in together. You got to test each other out, right? Got to make sure you're compatible. That's the wisdom of our day. Are you kidding? Well, what do you think is going to happen when you take two people, two normal people full of uh, insecurities, fear, and anxiety, Right, that's just any human being. We're, I know we all look tough this morning, but in reality, we're layered with insecurities, fear, and anxiety. Let's get them naked. Right? Let's expose their greatest vulnerabilities to one another. Let's put them in a context where there's chemicals exploding all over and then place them in a casual commitment in case one of them sees somebody better. What do you think is going to happen? No, that's not going to go well. No. You want the Genesis 2 biblical foundation of marriage so that when we release that supernatural sexual explosion, it's in the divine commitment of marriage, right? right? The illustration you use in this moment is that of a fire. Right, think of all those fires we've had out in California. Right? They're incredibly dangerous and destructive. Right? There, there's, there's, there's not enough people to contain it. And it's just ripping through wooded areas and, and houses. And it's incredible destruction and damage. But if you take that same explosive material of a fire and you put that fire in the commitment of a fireplace... It's completely different results, right? People gather around that fire for warmth and goodness and blessing. And it's similar with sex in marriage because it's the glory of marriage where we see a husband and wife make a commitment to one another that's strong enough to cradle the powerful gift of sex. Does that make sense? I mean, please don't ever think that, that, the, that the God of Scripture is against Sex. It's absolutely for sex. He created our body parts. He created our body parts to do and to feel what they feel, to feel pleasure. He created it to take place within marriage. Does that make sense? Listen, that's, that's not just what I've read in a book and I'm regurgitating to you today. That's that's what I've experienced in my life personally. Uh, I grew up in Dallas, Texas uh, in the 80s and 90s. I became sexually active at 14 years of age. And I spent the next six years of my life feeding on the narrative of our culture that sex was just physical. I can do whatever I want. Uh, with my body, and, and, I, and I did for, for six years. Uh, I, uh, well, for four years I, I did that because at 18 years of uh, age, I come to faith in Jesus. And uh, Jesus changes my life. Uh, but for those first two to three years, I, I lived this kind of double-sided life because um, there is forgiveness and healing in Jesus, but there's, there's also patterns uh, that we create when we do things with our bodies and and so I would I would show up to a worship service on a Sunday morning genuinely in awe of Jesus love everything that's taken place and then on Sunday night I would uh, go to downtown Dallas and and I, and I would just hook up with random girls uh, for like two or three years and and, and I 
just because I just had this pattern in, in, in my thinking. And so I, I'm 21, 22 years of age, and I, I, I meet my, my wife, Holly. I mean, I was exhausted from that pattern, that cycle just happening over and over. And so we meet, and, and we go on a date, and, and I just, I tell her, I say, hey, I don't even want to kiss and, and, unless we get married one day. And it's not because I, I read a book. I, I know in the 90s it was kind of popular, wear a ring, sign a pledge. I didn't, I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I had just experienced it uh, between the ages of 14 to 20, 21. I was just like, oh. <laughs> It was exhausting. It wasn't working. I just, I just thought, I, I, I want to be clear in this relationship, so let's not even uh, kiss. Um, and by God's grace, like, we waited to have sex uh, until we got married. We did start kissing when we got engaged. Uh, but I can tell you from personally, man, God's word changed my life. It's still changing my life produces a better harvest. Sometimes people will say sex before marriage, sex after marriage, it's, it's no different. You're still doing the same thing. It's completely different. For all the reasons we just talked about, it's completely different. It's taking place within the commitment of marriage. It's absolutely different. Listen, that's not just my story. There, our church family is full of, of, of families, of marriages and weddings that have a similar story. Our church is too small. I would share all their stories, but you would know the details, and you would go, oh, that's who that is? That's who that is, right? <laughs> I know you, you would, right? But it's absolutely true, we would. But they've also experienced that, that healing as well because of God's word. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're just like, Michael, this all sounds great, but you don't know the horrible things that I've done in my life, like I'm, I'm here to tell you, Jesus has come for the horrible things. Yes. That's what he does. He's come for all those horrible decisions that we make, making, and will make. And he shines his glory, and he shines his goodness into it, into the dark crevices of our soul, so that he can bring about confession and repentance and forgiveness and healing and, and goodness and, and, and life. That's what he does. That's the gospel. So there's nothing that's too horrible to keep us from Jesus. You need to hear that this morning. Right, that's, that's, he changes lives. That's absolutely the hope of the, of the gospel. And I want to invite you to respond to that if you've never responded to that. I don't want to be misleading. It doesn't mean that every, everything magically goes away. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't mean there's patterns and things that we need to work through and grow through that does need to happen. But it does mean in Jesus, those decisions are disarmed. They're disarmed. They're cleansed. You're made new. That's the hope of the gospel. Might we all respond to that this morning? Even if we were to walk out of here today, the, the good news of Jesus is so good that even if we walk out of here today and if we were to wander from his word and his truth, he still calls out to turn to him. He still calls out there's forgiveness in him. He still calls out that's not who you are anymore. You've been made new. Turn. Submit your passions to me. Trust in me. Follow me. There's life in him. And won't we all do that this morning? There'll be people here as we sing, as we respond. I mean, take advantage to pray. They will pray over you. They will pray for you. We want to do that this morning. We want to respond to God's word. Will you pray with me? Well, Father in heaven, I know this is challenging. It's challenging for me. But the reality is, is this, this conversation is too important for us to not talk about it, no matter what age we are. So I, I pray that the, that the bulk of what we hear this morning is the hope that's in Jesus. The hope of acknowledging the lie that's in our culture today and turning from that lie to submit our passions to you, to submit our desires to you, and to trust you, to ask for your help. Might we all respond that way this morning? We thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name, amen.